All right. Hi, everyone. We are going to start with our first lecture topic in Chem 12, and this is going to be on the topic of chemical kinetics. What we want to start with is just kind of explaining what chemical kinetics is and why we want to study it. So it's a study of the rates of reaction, which is how fast reactions go. And there's a bunch of applications that require you to know the rates of the reaction. So for example, if you want to slow down some unwanted reactions, for example, like milk or fruits or vegetables, they're spoiling in the fridge and you want to slow that down certain things you can do to it that causes those reactions to take longer to complete right so there's a number of things that you can imagine that you want to slow down there's of course other reactions that you want to speed up that might take forever to do but you really want to get it done quickly and then the more basic reason why we want to know the rate of reaction is just to understand how the reaction works and this is what we call reaction mechanism we want to know in a step-by-step fashion, you know, how the reactants get converted to product. And one of the key information that you need is the rate of the reaction, because you can propose certain steps that would explain why the reaction has that rate. So obviously, we need to understand what the meaning of the word rate is, and specifically how it applies to chemical reaction. So I'm just going to start by talking about the idea of rate, which is defined as the change of a quantity as a function of time. So if we're talking about the speed of the car, that's a rate, right? And it's measured in that case by the amount of distance that the car covers in some unit of time. Typically, we use the unit MPH, miles per hour. So that denotes that the, that the car covers of 60 miles in one hour, so distance per unit of time. With respect to chemical reaction, the rate here is measuring the change in the concentration so it could be concentration of reactant product over some unit of time, okay? So if we're looking at a general reaction, like reactant goes to product, we can express the relative rate with respect to each species using the following notation. So the rate with respect to the reactant would be written as the change in the reactant divided by the change in time. Now we want this rate to be always a positive number because concentration of the reactant in a chemical reaction decreases over time. So as a result, you add a negative in front of it just to make the number positive. And then the rate with respect to the product would then just be the change in the product concentration over the change in time. In this case, we don't need to put a negative sign because because products are increasing, so later time, you're gonna have more product compared to the earlier time. Now, let's talk a little bit about the practical aspect of this. How do I know the concentration of particular species at a given time? You can measure it using some of the characteristics of substances you're dealing with. Typically for AQ species that are non-ionic, a lot of times we can use spectroscopy to measure its concentration, meaning that usually it will absorb some wavelength and we can use that wavelength as a way to gauge how much of that species is present. In fact, in your lab experiment, the color change denotes how much of something is present. For gas, we typically can measure pressure. And for ionic species, we can measure its ability to conduct electricity. So here's just a quick example of using that color to help you visualize. So here's a reaction between bromine and formic acid to form bromide ion. And bromine, which is Br2, has an orange color. And as you can see, as the reaction progresses from left to right here, the color of that solution progressively becomes lighter and lighter. In fact, if we want to be a little bit more quantitative, instead of just looking at the color, we can also use a spectroscope to look at it. So what happens here is that bromine absorbs wavelength at 393 nanometers, which is like right about here. Okay, so at the beginning, when there's a lot of bromine in there, it's going to absorb a lot at that particular wavelength. So we see this peak at time one, you can see that it says T1. And then at time two, once the reaction progresses, that peak comes down a little bit. And then at time three, it comes down even more. So that's how we get this data of concentration versus time, okay? So here's just a quick example for you to think through on how to write rate expression that we just talked about. So let's say you have that reaction 2NO2 goes to 2NO plus O2. Write the rate expression for each of the C's in there. So as we said earlier, all you need to do is for the reactants, you're going to write it as negative delta, which denotes change, right, of the concentration of reactant over the change in time. So this expression right here. And then for product, you would just write it as delta of the product divided by delta T. So here I'm showing you 
all three of these and how you should write it. So for the NO2, which is the reactant, we're going to just put the negative and then delta of NO2 concentration over delta T. NO is one of the product. We're going to just do delta of NO concentration over delta T. And then for O2, it will be delta of O2 concentration over delta T. Now, I just talk about how we can measure the actual concentration over time. And the data that you'll get would look something like this. So this is for the reaction that you were just writing the rates for, which is that NO2 decomposition reaction to NO and O2. So you can measure the concentration of all these three gases as a function of time. So from the start of the reaction at time zero all the way to 400 seconds in this case. And we see that the NO2 concentration decreases, starts at 0 0.01 molar, goes down to 0 0.0031 molar, whereas the other two, which are the products, goes up. It starts from zero and then goes to some non-zero number. The question then becomes, how do I use these data to calculate my rate? Well, it depends what rate you want to calculate. So let's say you want to calculate the rate of NO2 disappearance in the first 100 seconds. You're going to, to use that rate expression that you wrote earlier, which is the negative of delta NO2 concentration over delta T. And then what delta means is always final minus initial. So you're going to have to figure out what is the final point and what's the initial point. In this case, because they're telling us 100 seconds, our final is the concentration at 100 seconds, and our initial is the concentration at the beginning, which is 0 seconds. So that's what I wrote here, NO2 final minus NO2 initial, and then the time is the same. You gotta take the final time minus the initial time. So if I go back up here and look at the 100 seconds, I notice that the value of NO2 at 100 seconds is 0 0.0065, at zero seconds is 0 0.01. So I use those two numbers, I plug it into this expression, and then for the time I use 100 minus zero. Notice that because you have that negative sign in front of it, makes it a positive number. You get this answer right here, which is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5 molar per second. So that's the unit of rate. That's concentration over time. And I would leave it up to you to do it for both the NO appearance in the first 100 seconds and the O2 appearance in the first 100 seconds. Okay, so you should get 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5 molar per second for NO and then 1.75 times 10 to the minus 5 molar per second for O2. Now notice that there's different numbers that we get. The first two we get the same number 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5 molar per second but then for the O2 we get a number that is different. So the question becomes which rate is actually the rate of the reaction because there's only one reaction even though you have three different species that are involved in the reaction. Well they're all correct because each of these rates is with respect to a particular species and hopefully Hopefully some of you might be thinking about this already, but the O2 rate, if you look at that number, 1.75, is actually, compared to that number, is half, right? And compared to the other number, it's also half. Whereas the NO and the NO2 have exactly the same number, 3.5. And if you're good with math, you will see that the equation itself has a 2 to 2 to 1 stoichiometry. So that means that for every time a reaction occurs, 2 of the NO2 is consumed to make 2 NO and only 1 O2. And that, in fact, is the reason why there is the same relationship here, which is 2, 2 to 1, or you can think of it as 1, 1 to 1 half, because that's exactly what the stoichiometry relationship is. So any of those rates are usable, but we typically would use something called a general rate, which is just the rate of each species divided by its coefficient. Because if you do that, then the rate will all be the same. So in this case, we would take the 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5, and then we would divide it by the coefficient of the NO2, which is 2. Then you get 1.75, which is that number right there. And then if you do it for the NO, the coefficient is also 2, so you get 1.75. For the oxygen, the coefficient is only 1, so it's already 1.75. So this is the generic formula that you can use to calculate the general rate, assuming you have a reaction where you have four different species, A, B, G, and H, and then the lowercase letter represents the coefficient. The general rate is calculated by taking the rate with respect to each species divided by its coefficient. Now, we just calculated the rate of these reaction in the first 100 seconds. And that's what we call average rate, right? So average rate, you just take it over a specific time span, like in this case, 100 seconds. And we use the definition of rate that we've been using, which is the change in the reactant or a change in product. Now, you can do that algebraically, which is what we did. But you can also do it geometrically.
So the way you would do this is you would actually plot the data. Here's my concentration of NO2. Here's my time. And you would just plot it. I'm not going to do it too carefully here, but this sort of highlights what the plot would look like. And if you're interested in the rate for the first 100 seconds, what you will do is you will just say, this is the data at zero seconds. And let's say this is the data at 100 seconds. And you might remember from math that if I were to draw a line that goes through those two data points, the slope of that line is the same as delta y over delta x. Since y in this case is NO2 and x is time, I get the expression of rate there. So the slope of that line is my rate, okay? It's going to have a negative value because it's a downward sloping line. So you're going to put a negative in front of it to convert it to rate to make it a positive number. But what I'm trying to get across here is that geometrically, the slope of a line that connects two data points in the concentration versus time data is also the rate of the reaction. Now, those of you who have taken calculus, you might realize that the rate changes as the reaction progresses. So a lot of times what we want to do is calculate something called the instantaneous rate, which is the rate at a particular time point. We can do this two ways also, the same as the average rate. You can do it using calculus, but this class doesn't require you to have a prerequisite of calculus, so we're not going to do it. But we can also still do it geometrically, pretty much the same way as what we just did here, except that instead of finding two data points, you would basically just use one data point. Okay, let's say I'm interested in the rate at 250 seconds. Let's just say that that's 250 seconds. So what I would do is draw a line, what we call a tangent line, which is a line that touches that curve only at that point right there. So let's say that's the line. And the slope of this line would be equal to the instantaneous rate at 250 seconds, okay? So that would be the way you would do it if you don't have calculus to help you do the calculation. The last type of rate that's important is something called the initial rate. This is important because a lot of times as the reaction progresses, the rate of the reactions is affected by products or other intermediates that are produced during the reaction. So if we want to know the true rate of the reactions, what we want to do is measure the rate at the very start of the reaction, which is what we call the initial rate. And so that is just your in instantaneous rate at time zero, okay, which is as close to the beginning of the reaction as possible. So this plot right here shows you the different types of rates that we have the average rate plot b right here so you're taking the rate from zero to 60 seconds for this reaction you just draw a line calculate the slope of that line so that would represent the average rate for the entire experiment the slope of plot c on the other hand will show you the average rate for the first 10 seconds d is the instantaneous rate at that particular time, which looks like 35 seconds in this case. And then you can also have the initial rate. So that A represents the initial rate. So that's the rate that is measured right at the beginning of the reaction, right? So you see that that tangent line is drawn at time equals zero. So that would be initial rate and the slope of that line would give you the initial rate. Okay, so we were just looking earlier at the calculation of rate for this reaction, NO2 goes to NO and O2. And we noticed that the rate for NO2 and NO are the same, whereas the rate for O2 is half the rate of those two other species. And it turns out that the stoichiometry of the reaction is such that the same relationship is observed there. So we have exactly O2 being half of the other two. And in fact, that's exactly how you're going to calculate the rate of all the other species if you know the rate of one species. So this is what we call relative rate, right? So if you know the rate of one, you can calculate the rate of the other two or any other species that you want from the reaction itself. So this example is just highlighting how we are going to do that using stoichiometry. It says, write the equation that relates the rate of ammonia disappearance to the rate of appearance of nitrogen and hydrogen gas. So let me make this a little bigger. The rate with respect to ammonia should just be the change in ammonia concentration divided by the change in time. And then don't forget to put that negative sign there since it's a reactant. With respect to N2, which is the first product, to get that rate, all we need to do is take the rate of the reactant, which is this expression right here, and just multiply it by the stoichiometric relationship or mole to mole ratio between the product that we want to the reactant that we have. Okay, so in this case, that's that's one to two stoichiometry, and that's what I would write there as the equation. And then with respect to hydrogen, we're going to again start with the rate of the reactant. Now we're going to use hydrogen on the top and then ammonia at the bottom. And that ratio is three to two. Now we're going to do an example with one of these formulas that we just derived. 
for calculating the rate of a species. So the question here is, what is the rate of appearance of H2 if the rate of disappearance of ammonia is 1.94 times 10 to the minus 6? We're basically using this equation right here. So we take the rate with respect to ammonia which is the number that's given. And then we multiply it by the stoichiometric relationship between hydrogen and ammonia. The unit of rate is molar per second, but in this case, it's molar of ammonia, right? Since we're talking about the rate of disappearance of ammonia. So molar of ammonia, of course, mole of ammonia per liter of solution. And then it's molar per second, so the second is also at the bottom. But here's the interesting thing. You see that the moles of ammonia there will cancel with the moles of ammonia here. So your final answer then would have moles of H2 per liter per second. So moles of H2 per liter per second is just molar of H2 per second, okay? So then you get your answer that way. So that would be the way you would calculate any other rate in a reaction once you know the rate with respect to one of the species.